morning and welcome back to the final day of Real Estate Live UK's October 2021 programme. Our weeks of free to attend virtual events run three times a year in February, June and October. The programme is brought to you by White Label and our partners and sponsors. And we'd like to take this opportunity to thank all the organisations that have contributed to the exceptional lineup taking place this week. During the sessions this week, places across the UK have showcased opportunities and industry leading experts from the public and private sectors discuss new ideas and topical issues related to property. Recordings of all our sessions this week will soon be available online on our website, www.realestatelife.co.uk. Several of the panels and presentations this week have been linked to our key themes, culture and community, sustainable places and wellness. Right now, we head to Waltham Forest for a session in partnership with Waltham Forest Council, exploring inclusive growth and building out of the pandemic. Just before we start, I'd like to remind you, the audience, to please feel free to ask questions using Zoom's Q&A function. And now I'm pleased to hand over to our chair for this session, Nicola Mabbers, Chief Executive of Future of London. Over to you, Nicola. Thanks very much, Callum. And absolutely delighted to be chairing this session this morning. Uh, as Callum said, I'm Chief Executive of Future of London. Um, we've been working with Waltham Forest for very many years. They're probably one of our most engaged members, always keen to put on uh, field trips to showcase the exciting programmes that they're involved in across London and contribute thought leadership to London-wide events. So great to see some of the team here today, but they're also joined with some of their really key development partners. And what we're going to be discussing um, and showcasing this morning is the exciting projects and initiatives that are going on, but also talking about some of the opportunities that are still available in the borough. Uh, as Callum said, I would really encourage you to post your questions in the Q&A function, um, say who you are and who your question is for and do that at any time. And then I'll collect those questions up at the end and, and we'll have a bit of a Q&A session. But let's get us started. Um, so I'd like to invite Councillor Simon Miller to really set the context for the session this morning. Um, Councillor Miller is the lead member for economic growth and housing development. So it'd be great if you could really talk about the council's strategic priorities um, uh, what, what are you really looking to do over the next couple of months and how are you going to ensure that Waltham Forest growth is truly inclusive? So over to you, Councillor Miller. Uh, Nicola, thank you so much and good morning, everyone. Thank you all for your interest in Waltham Forest. It's always a delight to be able to speak at these occasions. I'm actually in the town hall at the moment in our beautifully restored town hall, but like every beautifully restored town hall in the country, uh, councillors are kept in a small grey room, so you don't get the full magnificence of what has been achieved from the from the view behind me. Um, so what are we doing? What's our focus and where are we headed? I think like everyone, our absolute focus is on how we build back from COVID, how we build back from the pandemic, how we do so by ensuring really resilient economic growth as we go forward, how we ensure that those of our people who are furthest from the job market have access to those opportunities um, and that we ensure that whatever we do, however we go about it, the last 18 months have not been for nothing and that we do so better. So a huge focus of what we're trying to achieve is how we take forward our build program, how we take forward our strategic sites that Stuart will talk to shortly, how we take forward that agenda of building 27,000 new homes over the next 15 years for our people so that we bear down on our housing weightiness. We ensure that our children have opportunities to live in the place in which they grew, have grown up and have been raised. Um, how we use that quantum of development to transform, restore and rebuild our unique town centres, ensure that the high streets in those town centres are vibrant, are thriving and have real opportunity for our people as we go forward. Uh, so we're doing everything we can, not just to take forward our own key sites, but also to enable those key sites which have been brought forward by our development partners to, to come forward as quickly as possible. In terms of how we ensure that the growth that those new sites generates is inclusive, it's all about how we extract the maximum social and economic value from them, how we ensure that training and job opportunities on those sites are going to local people, how we ensure that the supply chains are benefiting our local businesses, and how we ensure that where we are bringing forward mixed sites, where we are bringing forward employment land and industrial land, 
that accommodation is suitable for the jobs of the future, businesses of the future, those key growth sectors that we know are going to be the basis of future prosperity, be it culture, be it creativity, be it digital, be it construction, be it engineering, be it the green economy, making certain that we have a really strong basis across each and every one of those key sectors so that we can build on that and we can provide new opportunity as we go forward. But I think one of the things that we're absolutely determined to do is to make sure that we've responded to some of the really positive changes that have taken place over the past 18 months. That new sense of community, that repurposing of what a council should be. One of the things that I'm always particularly proud about in Wolf and Forest is that we've gone from simply being an administrative area to in which people lived in their in, in either Leighton or Leightonstone, and we've built a really special sense of place. People are now proud to come from Wolf and Forest, whereas once they came from Chingford. And it's about how we as a council harness that new sense of community, that new sense of purpose to take forward our existing agendas, to deliver those existing agendas in a better way that delivers greater benefit to our communities. And we see that happening on our Leebridge station sites, where not only are we providing well over 300 new homes for local residents, but we're providing a new station, brand new green amenity, a community fund that can be used by the community to its own benefit. So there's a really clear link between development as it comes forward and a much wider societal benefit. I think one of the things that we need to focus on too as we go forward is our residents changing priorities, how they are now prioritizing health, access to green space, the ability to be able to work from home, and how we build that into our own agenda. So that means we're going to be absolutely focused on delivering a new hospital at Whips Cross. It's going to be ensuring that as development comes forward, it enhances the local environment, that it adds to our green amenity, that particularly after the summer that we've had, it helps deal with historic problems with our drainage system by better mitigating against future flooding. It's extraordinary that after the last year or so, that in Waltham Forest, we had to deal with a summer of floods. As a borough, we have never had to deal with that. We need to respond to these changing priorities. Just because we had flooding, it doesn't mean that we need to pull the plug on development. In fact, the exact opposite is true. We need to use that development to change and make good that historic underinvestment. So there's a whole host of things, a reset for the council, a new focus and renewed focus on green, a renewed focus on livability and community, but above all, delivering on the homes that people need, the regeneration of our town centres and the transformation of our growth areas. Now, I think I was down to talk for eight minutes. I think that's exactly eight minutes as I look at the clock. So at that point, Nicola, I shall hand back to you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Councillor Miller. I appreciate the, the good timing. That's fantastic. And a great sort of setting out the, the kind of the, the real um, highlights for the borough. Um, I'm now going to invite um, Stuart Murray to give us a little bit more detail, really put a bit more flesh on the actual specific projects and programmes that are going on across the across the borough. So Stuart, can you tell us about the council's strategic priorities um, and particularly with a with a focus maybe on your town centres and, and the recent industrial master planning work? So over to you, Stuart. Thanks, Nicola. It's delight to be here. Um, Stuart Murray's the council's economic growth and housing delivery director. Um, I think we've got some slides that uh, Jonathan's going to be putting up. Um, I yeah, definitely want to uh, build on what Councillor Simon Miller uh, discussed and was leading on in showing that we build better out of the pandemic and uh, we deliver benefits to our residents and revive our high streets and our business areas. And uh, as, as Councillor Simon Miller described, the council's gone through with its development and investment plan as a whole reset uh, through the pandemic. I'm very proud to say that um, I worked uh, every day uh, for 18 months in council's premises not remotely uh, and that was a sort of a leadership challenge uh, at the beginning of the lockdown in, May, in March 2020 uh, and during that time we oversaw from the uh, what was the former magistrates court at um, uh, Walthamstow overlooking the town hall we saw uh, the construction and refurbishment as, as council Simon described in our town hall uh, and we opened we finished that work and we opened a, an amazing new refurbished town hall 
uh, and uh, we created a new fountain for our public. Uh, and very importantly, that sort of helped to revitalize the economy. Could you go back to the previous slide, please? Um, and very importantly, we've got these real priorities around jobs, recovery, uh, 15 minute neighborhoods, ensuring inclusive growth for our residents and our communities, uh, a cultural dimension to this and using culture as a bond to uh, embrace our communities and the investment in coming and put in a real climate emergency wrap around this net zero carbon and planting trees uh, and ensuring development is, is, is clean, green and safe. Uh, and those priorities in that left hand corner, jobs, healthy lives. <laughs> Uh, the industrial floor space and the new homes uh, we are looking to deliver those and very much we about making sure that we do deliver them they're not just targets um, we are protecting our strategic industrial locations and we are also enhancing our high streets we may have benefited from the zoom shock as it's said around um, uh, outer London workforce uh, that would traditionally be commuting to central London being local. But we've really gone for a shop local campaign uh, and make sure that our our people will spend their money locally and help revitalise local businesses, as well as helping businesses with grants uh, and support coming out of the pandemic. We have a business and in a local a local employers uh, forum that we're helping them to revitalise. And we're working with our high street bids uh, and our uh, communities to make sure that we have the right sort of offer. Next slide, please. Uh, we've got half a billion pounds of council direct investment with our partners. Uh, interestingly, we spent um, 135 million during the pandemic period in 2021, which was our highest ever capital outlay. And a lot of that is working with our part development partners and people like TfL and government uh, and the GLA on affordable housing. And we're very much focused on the inclusive growth and uh, lead bridge EMD, um, over four and a half thousand weeks of apprenticeships, 12,000 hours of young people work and 33 million pounds of social investment. And this is over and above section 106 contributions and seal. Uh, so that's really important that uh, the benefits of growth are inclusive for our communities and our residents, and they are extracted and delivered on the ground into communities, uh, delivering sustainable, healthy, vibrant neighbourhoods and high streets. And that's where we are very much working in partnership with, with all our part development partners uh, that are on that mission that we deliver good and beneficial and green growth. Next slide, please. Uh, and we really are now ramping up uh, rather than slowing down with the pandemic, uh, as Councillor Simon described, you know, we want to build uh, uh, good inclusive growth in, in infrastructure investment is really important to that and communicating the benefits of growth to our communities to take them on board. So we've divided the borough up into three zones. There is the north, the centre and the south, which are very different. And we're creating design and characteristic zones for those. We're protecting our strategic industrial locations, but we're also being quite innovative around that. And we're bringing some major growth areas. Every part of our borough uh, has a sort of 15 minute neighborhood or a growth uh, investment location around good growth, inclusive growth. Uh, and we're engaging very intensively with communities around transformation, uh, the high street revitalization and those 15 minute neighborhoods. Next slide, please. Uh, and very much, I think what distinguishes um, Orphan Forest from other parts of London and the country is its cultural dimension following the borough culture's successful year in 2019. We have a legacy target to ensure we embed culture in everything we do, particularly real estate uh, and investment in our neighbourhoods. Uh, and in response to COVID, we ensured that culture acted as a bond, uh, embraced and, and, and brought communities together. And we connected to communities when they were often separated by, by lockdown and social distancing. We use culture to revitalize our high streets and our open spaces. We've created this incredible investment at Fellowship Square at our town hall and our new fountain. Uh, and we are investing in cultural infrastructure and our creative enterprise zone at Black Horse Lane. We put, a, as a council, put our money where our mouth is and we're investing uh, 25 million pounds in a new theater. Uh, who would invest in the theater uh, in a pandemic? 
uh, and we are going to open that in a year's time with our operator, uh, Soho Theatre, uh, who are going to create a national comedy theatre in Waltham Forest, uh, linked to their central London theatre, uh, and have real local benefits. And we're creating local jobs, creative jobs and artistic jobs. Next slide, please. This is your one minute warning, Stuart. Thank you. Uh, and Fellowship Square is now become a sort of phenomenon culturally. Uh, we're using that as a space for the community to take control of. Next slide. And this is the theatre. You can see uh, we've got one year of building works and it's a thousand seater and we'll be coming up, opening that in a year's time and sharing that with you. Next slide. And just planning for prosperity. This is about our holistic approach and our local plan and all our documents that support uh, green, inclusive, uh, and holistic development with uh, involving good design and the highest quality of architecture for place changing. Next slide. Uh, and this is just one of the growth areas where we're working in New Spitalfields and Leighton next to the Olympic Park, where we're delivering 6,000 homes and thousands of new jobs around our strategic industrial locations and brownfield areas. Next slide. Uh, and over property, these are the major projects we're dealing with. We can share these slides with you. But we're working both in community development and major development house building, 50% affordable housing in as many schemes as we can with our partners and creating new infrastructure. And final slide, uh, this is uh, our capital investment strategy in a nutshell, creating thousands of new jobs, new affordable homes, commercial space, revitalised high streets. And Jonathan will share more with you in due course. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much. There's a lot to pack into that. And I'm sure we'll probably come back to some of those topics. I'm really interested in the, the culture as a kind of a driver for economic recovery. So maybe we'll come back to that. But thank you very much, Stuart. Um, so now we're going to um, hear from some of the borough's real key development partners. And I'm going to invite Richard Davison, who's director at Wilmot Dixon, um, Given obviously health has been such a massive priority uh, in as a result of the of COVID, the pandemic, um, it'd be really interesting to hear from you about how collaboration between the public and private sector can help create healthier places. So um, over to you, Richard. Thank you, Nicola. As I said earlier, it's the big question. Um, do you know what the first thing I was thinking about actually is just listening to, to Councillor Miller and then listening to Stuart was about how organised Waltham Forest are. And I've been involved for a really long time, actually, some really early stuff around schools and leisure facilities. And just there's a plan and that gives us real comfort in the part in the private sector to kind of bring our A game. Yeah. Um, so I have just to compliment people really on that. But one of the things that's really great as well is there's a sense of um, a, a social purpose, which is something that, you know, is, it can be missing sometimes. And if we haven't got that in place, you're not quite sure what you're looking to deliver. So. What, I've, what I was hearing as well from Councillor Miller was a, a kind of a people-focused strategy. And that's really where jobs I've been involved in. And we, we're involved in the EMD cinema, um, you know, delivering a fantastic cultural piece for, for Walthamstow, which is going to kind of brighten people's days and uh, bring a sense of purpose. But one of the things for me that I've learned a lot about through the pandemic around those health spaces is what, what is that lo real core local need? Because uh, it's very different in every place that we work. And one of the things that that's really encouraging is is being able to kind of bring some of our expertise and knowledge around whether that's driving skills and employment, whether that's delivering um, social value, whether that's something around work experiences and finding the right things to bring for that local authority. So we, we're really excited about what we've been able to do at the EMD Cinema recently, which is working with some young people during the lockdown virtual work experience. We've never delivered so much work experience as we have virtually. Um, but one of the things that, that might surprise people is it's not particularly working on what you might expect from a contractor or a builder. It's actually working on some of those skills that are going to empower those young people for a long term. So that's working on things like their emotional intelligence. That's working on their own personal branding. That's helping them to focus on their mental well-being. Because we know if we can build young, resilient people, they can go out and they can knock the world apart. You know, that's that's what we should be doing. And I think that's been a real key focus for us is, is move that, move the needle on slightly, you know, change, change, change the conversation. Health and well-being is always about being prepared. And one of the challenges we have in our system is, particularly in the NHS, is we're still sometimes dealing with the problem mm -hmm. rather than what's caused the problem. So that's where we get to work in a long-term relationship with the local authority is as well as maybe dealing with that symptom 
is actually what we can really do is get down into the down into the detail. And I think that's what's been happening with us at the EMD. So I wasn't really going to talk about how many trees one should plant, whether we should, you know, we should be building zero carbon buildings. So we should be doing something about pollution. We should be finding smart ways of um, the 15 minute neighborhood, you know, making sure that people can, can get around on their own two feet or on their bike. You know, all of those great ideas we can all bring together. But actually, the first and most important thing that we try to focus on is who are the people, what are their needs, and how can we support them in their development? So uh, the, the thing is that the question you gave me is so massive, we could spend an hour. So um, yeah. I've kept it short and sweet. So thank you. Thanks, Richard. And it's so uh, we do a lot of work around leadership skills at Future of London anyway. And we've had lots of conversations about talent and bringing people into the sector. And it's just really refreshing to hear about well, one, the fact you managed to do work experience online, that's amazing, but also really thinking about people's personal skills as opposed to technical skills. And that is what is going to build a, a resilient generation. So yeah. congratulations on that. I might follow up with you afterwards. But um, Thank you. Okay. Um, so uh, now I'd like to introduce um, Angie, who is from LNQ. LNQ, obviously, have been working in the borough for a really long time. Um, Angie, would you just share with us the sorts of projects um, that you've been doing in the borough? Um, and Obviously, as I said at the beginning, really interested to to hear your views on on how you champion inclusive growth as we build out of the pandemic. Thank you, Nicola. Um, morning, everyone. I'm Angie Hooper, Business Development Director uh, for l and um, We've enjoyed a really successful, positive uh, relationship with Wolf and Forest for a number of years. Our stock holding in the borough is in excess of 7,000 homes. So it's been a really key investment borough for us over a number of years. The um, And these affordable homes have contributed to the housing targets. We've delivered a mixture of schemes. Um, Flaxham Road, which was an extra care scheme. We've delivered what we would consider um, plot developer land-led schemes. We've joined with other partners for joint ventures in the borough. So, for example, Black Horse Road, um, currently on site at the moment, XTFL site. We have a really big scheme at South Grove, Paper Mill Place. Um, these schemes have facilitated not only housing, which is a, a big need, but also um, the facilitation of a much needed medical centre. We um, what we, we kind of forewent some of our benefits to ensure that the medical centre was delivered because it was a key priority for the borough. We've supported the Lower Lee Valley Heat Network, um, which is another key borough strand, as well as introducing car clubs and all of these wider kind of scheme specifics contribute to the borough's objectives. In addition to this, about three years ago, we set up a Build London partnership, which is a joint development with the GLA. And this was really to facilitate um, and help smaller housing associations build new affordable homes in London. Now, this initiative started with nine partners. We now have 45, and it ranges from cooperatives, small housing associations, community organisations, and, and charities. Um, the benefits of an, of an initiative like the Build London Partnership to the community are the placemaking, employment, use of local labour, engagement of SME builders, consultants, etc. So that really chimes with the borough's inclusive growth. Um, we also are, Wolf and Forest remain a really key investment borough for us, and we're looking forward to continuing our partnership with the borough to respond to their recent needs as we come out of the pandemic. Great, thanks very much. And Angie, the, the Build London partnership is really interesting because I think a lot of people are obviously really keen to make sure, as, mm -hmm. as Councillor Miller said at the beginning, that the supply chain is also local and you know local small businesses, which is always mm -hmm. a challenge, isn't it, is to, for small businesses yeah. to be involved in big procurement exercises. Mm -hmm. So that, that's really, really interesting. Um, thank you. Uh, and then I'm going to turn to Dan um, Batten, who's head of Build to Rent at L LNG. Um, Dan, it'd be really interesting to hear from you to start with why LNG have decided to invest in Waltham Forest and where do you see the opportunities um, in the borough going forward? Thanks and uh, good morning, everybody. Um, our investment in Waltham Forest started about 
four or five years ago, and it was our first build to rent scheme. And it was going to be big. It was is a hundred and eighty million pound investment into the borough, and it was the second build to rent scheme to go through the planning process in London. And with innovation comes risk, and we worked with Waltham Forest and very much in a partnership. I would say we we had a really clear, open, honest discussion day one with the leadership of the council to understand what the vision was, and it was really clear and simple. The vision of what Waltham Forest want to deliver was really clear and simple for us to understand. And it was throughout those four or five years it took us to, to deliver and fully occupy, what, 500 homes, it's been consistent. Consistency and simplicity is really important when we're investing. And that has been a huge benefit throughout throughout the last few years. I think the other the other area was a, a willingness to think outside the box. Um, I don't know if there are any planners on the line, but it's not always easy in within planning discussions to think outside the box. But as built to rent is a new sector, a new business model, a new reason for us investing, and there are, it created new opportunities. Whether it was the fact that some of our Section One Hundred Six payments are spread over ten years. That allows us to pay more Section 106 and allows us to have a longer term commitment to support local local um, amazing resources like the wetlands. Um, just recognising that the value of a different business model can, can provide something different and have different opportunities. And we've got 500 homes. We've got 30 percent of those are specifically for key workers in the borough because that was a need at the time we discussed with the the council what they really needed and it was supporting key workers and so we're really pleased that we've got over 100 homes specifically for key workers in our scheme where we could use what we wanted to do that also met the ambitions of the the local authority so we want to find more opportunities in the borough um, and I think for any other developers listening it, it's it's often unusual to find a borough that recognizes they they are competing with other boroughs we can invest anywhere we want we can invest anywhere in London or, in fact, anywhere in the UK. And an open door is really helpful. Having somebody that you can go and speak to and, and explain what you're trying to achieve and, and have an, an open, grown-up discussion about what's the right solution for anybody is really helpful to get to a quick decision and quick solutions. Thanks very much, Dan. And we certainly see that at Future of London working across the borough is probably the same as you. You'll get... Some that are very, very ambitious and really clear and, and really know what they want and, and, and some other boroughs uh, less so, I guess. And it must be a lot easier to work with a borough that, that is very clear. And like you say, that consistency, which is I think is tough with the political cycles. But um, OK, that's good. That's great to hear. Um, and so our final um, panellist we're going to hear from is Jonathan Martin, who's director of Inward Investment at Waltham Forest. So we've heard a lot about things that are already happening, things that are in the pipeline, things that are being delivered. And I think, Jonathan, you're going to talk to us about the future opportunities that are available uh, for potential developers coming forward. So over to you, Jonathan. Thank you very much, Nicola, and good morning, everyone. Um, one of the things that's really enjoyable about having these investor events is just the breadth of investors that are existing investors that we can call upon to speak about their experiences. And that's something that we really treasure in terms of the work, the joint working that we've seen come forward and how we've actually delivered schemes. So we're not talking about necessarily concepts or plans. There are delivered schemes that people are living in, living in and experiencing the borough in its truest sense in terms of the, the culture and heritage it has to offer as well as the fantastic, uh, fantastic opportunities for, for life chances. So we have a big inward investment activity program around marketing and really engaging with investors existing and new for the borough's opportunities. Lee Bridge is a key growth area for us in the southwest of the borough. Um, and we've been looking at how we can bring forward a number of our own assets, as was touched on by Stuart and, uh, and his presentation a bit earlier. Um, Low Hall Depot remains one of our our key assets in terms of how we can potentially bring forward this location to the southwest of the borough. It sits about uh, five minutes or so from Lee Bridge Station, which is a station we opened about uh, four years ago, four or five years ago, uh, May 2016. And it sits also equidistant with St. James Station, which is at the overground. So it's well connected in terms of public transport. 
Um, and also it has an, an amazing opportunity to, to really transform this location. We're looking at reproviding a, a council depot. Um, we're also looking at embracing this as a 15 minute neighborhood in terms of master planning. It's got potentially circa 600 homes as, uh, as part of that footprint that, come, that, that can come forward. Um, and we're looking at what we can do around making sure we replace the commercial and, and industrial element of this development as well. Really important for us to understand the art of the possible. So there's lots of work currently going on around the business case and where we are in terms of procurement. We believe that's going to give us about, uh, about spring next year um, to see this come out to, to market. And as you can see on the screen, this is just a, an artist's impression and a visual, but it shows a sort of connectivity to some of the other low-line neighbourhoods that uh, are joining that particular space. And here you've got a, another artist's impression of what potentially could be this new 15-minute neighbourhood. We're really keen on making sure that, again, it embeds with uh, the existing communities. Um, and that's something that's really quite unique about Waltham Forest. We haven't got many blank canvas sites. You've got to integrate. You've got to look at how you can work with the existing community, existing residents, particularly around how you can really feed into the, the network that's already there, particularly around our, our Enjoy Waltham Forest network, which has been, what, 42 kilometres now of installed uh, cycleways and pedestrian pathways, um, which knit across the borough, basically. In Waltham, so we've got Chestnut's House, which is a grade two star listed building, and we are working on how we can bring this potential opportunity forward as well. It's something we've been really keen to uh, to explore as a gem within the borough. It's got a, a significant presence, as you can see, with a, a forecourt in front of it. And I'm happy to uh, take any of our uh, our viewers on investor tours to pick up these opportunities and really make sure that there's that uh, that discussion as part of Invest Waltham Forest. Um, and that is something we really want to see brought forward in terms of where it sits just to the, the east of the, of the town centre. It's an opportunity that I think we should really look to explore. What has also been touched on is that we have got a, a big range of growth north, central and south of the borough. And again, happy to engage with, uh, with partners and investors to take them on investor tours and bring them around the borough to actually see and feel these investments because that's the feedback we get. So hopefully that's been uh, quite a, an interesting taster for you before I hand back to, uh, hand back to uh, Nicola. We did have a video that we would also like to play. Um, so I'm hoping that uh, our uh, white label creative are able to play our promotional video very quickly. Um, and that should give you, a, again, a flavour of what the borough is, uh, what the borough is about. Thank you.
Brilliant. That's a fantastic video. Thank you for sharing that, Jonathan. Um, just so rich, isn't it? It's just there's just so much going on in Waltham Forest, and it, it just comes across as a very exciting place to live. Um, I think in terms of so, uh, in terms of um, the audience, as it again reinforced, you're very welcome to ask Q and A. Um, I've got some questions up my sleeve, but really would be really interesting to hear your reflections on the presentations and any specific questions you have, both for the Waltham Forest team and for the development partners that are joining us this morning. Um, I think. Future of London is running a programme called Building Recovery, Closing the Gap. And it's all about how the city is going to recover with a real focus on inequality. So I'm really interested in maybe talking a little bit more about what in close, inclusive growth really means. And I think my first question is, is to Dan, obviously, the huge rise in, in ECG um, investment. So but I'm really interested to see what do investors really see as the S in that? What what sort of social benefits do they expect from their um, from their investments, from the development, and then the question then to to um, to Angie um, and Richard about what do, what what does social um, what does uh, inclusive growth mean to you in in real kind of reality? What does that actually mean in terms of what you deliver on the ground? So Dan, first question to you. Yeah, it's thanks, Nicola. Well, th thanks for a really difficult question. <laughs> um, you're right, the, the E of ESG is a lot, it's not easy to deliver, but it's easier to measure. We have yeah. science that can help us with that. It's really difficult to measure the social impact, but the pension funds that I invest on behalf of all want to know. They want yeah. to know what positive impact they're having. And equally, is there any negative impact they're having, which obviously we have to reduce and mitigate. And it's there are ways of measuring it in, in pounds and pence, which is one way. I think it's more the ethos of the way you approach the development. And in Waltham Forest, we found, and actually across the country, try and identify community leaders. And these are not necessarily politicians, apologies to the politicians on the line. They're not necessarily politicians, but the community leaders that runs the local coffee shop and here's what everybody thinks, or is um, a startup business working in a co-working space mm -hmm. and understands the other incubator space needs and get their opinions about what a local area needs and get speak to them and get them to speak to other people to find out what things other than your development are required in that local area. I'm a, I'm a complete believer in the, the 15 minute neighborhoods. I think that's a really great way of having that at the heart of a development to be, to look at that whole 15 minute radius. It's really easy, especially building homes, it's really easy to just look inwards at what you're doing. And it's really difficult to look outwards. And what we've tried to do is bring local businesses into what we're doing. So at, at Black Horse Mills, we've got um, four local businesses who have come together to set up a new company and they're curating our commercial space. And they are running poetry evenings. And I think there's an art exhibition on at the moment they're waiting for a new pizza oven to come from Napoli, but they are curating that space for the needs of the local community. Um, and it's nothing we could do. We're just some big corporate investing money for the long term. We cannot be the part of the DNA of the community to do that. We have to get people from the community in. Mm. But it's, I guess it's easier to explain what we're doing rather than how we can measure it. That's probably the answer. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And, um, Richard and Angie, the same question to you, really, in terms of what it actually gets done on the ground, what's inclusive growth mean for you? I'll go with Richard first. OK, um, what does inclusive growth mean to us? So there are some measures that we can use. So there's the, the nationally understood TOMS, the, the themes of measurement, which, are, which enable you to understand some of the value of what you deliver, which is really helpful because I think both Jonathan and Stuart put up some numbers there on the uh, kind of a pounds and pence social value that's measured. But for us, what we we measure ourselves on um, helping those who probably need the, the most help. Mm. So for us, we talk about um, changing lives. So it's, it's, it's a fairly simple thing for us. You know, are we changing lives? And one of the things that EMD actually is, so whilst we've been working with um, we've been working with people who have been long-term unemployed and some of the problems that they have are sometimes it's just around helping to rebuild their confidence. Mm. It takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of investment. 
the the number of people that you might get up through the gears is actually relatively modest but the value add for their lives and for their families and picking up what Dan was saying about those communities is if you help to pull someone up properly actually they have a bigger impact on more than one person yeah. so we can only really measure the one person that we've helped but we know we our heart tells us and some of the stories you hear tell you that you've actually influenced an entire family and particularly when you're working with those who are long-term unemployed is you know the, the reasons for that are myriad and that is it. the most of those reasons I cannot solve and they can't be solved by one agency but if we can help give that leg up so that for us is is really where we we work really hard um you know we put dedicated resources in our business to make that happen and it's not happened overnight for us either we've probably been on sort of six seven years at least of a journey um what we're now seeing at EMD is we're kind of in the we're in the groove so to speak and actually now we're being asked well can you do more this is like okay well if we started that three years ago so yes we will do more so we're learning from those and I think Dan hit the nail on the head really is when you engage with the local communities, they bring the ideas. Mm. We sometimes just bring the firepower to, to turn them into reality. Mm. But I think what you're both saying is a long term investment, isn't it? You yeah. can't you can't help people. You can't support people in, in just six months and then expect them to to, you know, to then go on to employment and, and, and secure those jobs in the long term. It does take a lot of time to spend with people. And um, but like you say, it does that the, the kind of but I guess it's difficult to measure, isn't it? Because you might just be judged on you've got one person into employment who stayed in employment for more than six months. But actually, the impact of that, as you say, is much broader, but it's quite hard to measure that sort of thing. Um, but I guess you've got the narrative and you've got the stories that go with the figures. So, um, Angie, same question to you. Yeah, I think for us, um, as a social landlord in the borough, the key priority is providing quality services and quality homes for our residents. We engage quite a lot with our residents and we listen to the needs of them. Um, and a bit like Dan was saying, when you listen to the needs of, of the local people when you're trying to develop a community and create a place, mm that people want to live, work and, and thrive in. It's really important that as much as we align with, with the political ambition, we are also listening to the residents. In terms of what we're doing on the ground, um, our residents in, in Wolfham Forest can benefit from our tenancy sustainment, employment support, pound advice, etc. We in, in l &Q have a foundation which um, supports vulnerable general needs residents to remain in their homes. And, and that tenancy sustainment over the last 12, 18 months has been really important. Mm -hmm. We have um, Pound Advisors served 3,000 residents and put 11 million back in their pockets in 2021 in increased income and reduced debt and reduced outgoing. So these are some really tangible outputs. This is across our wider portfolio, not just in Wolfham Forest, but um, our employment service has also spent the first six months of, of this year when or last year when they were in lockdown, making welfare calls to ensure that our most vulnerable residents have the help and support that they need. And... We've supported over 200 l &Q residents back into employment. So these are some really positive, tangible um, outputs that we as a, as a group are doing. OK, thank you. And obviously, affordable housing is, uh, you know, is one of the key challenges for London. Um, and, and we've heard a lot about the kind of the massive um, evacuation from London. So I guess my question to Dan and Angie and Richard is, if the rumour is true that everyone's leaving London, why are you still delivering and got a pipeline for so many homes? <laughs> Dan, over to you first. Um, yeah, I think the, the starting point is it's rubbish. <laughs> um, <that laughs> Not the living are, in London bit, the leaving. <laughs> the people leaving en masse is rubbish. I mean, the, the maths is um, migration into London happens every year and it is principally 20 to 35 year olds who move into London. And... There is a consistent demographic that's happened for years and years that as people get older, often people do move out of London and have a, choose a different lifestyle. And that exact same demographic, that same trend happened in 2020. The only difference was people physically couldn't move house to move into London. The normal number of people moved out of London that, that would happen in any normal year. It's just we didn't see the inward migration to the same extent. And 
it is happening now. I mean, we're seeing it in our own schemes. The, the speed of people moving back to London is rapid at the moment. Uh, today, it is happening. And it's happening because, well, people don't live in cities just so that they can get to an office easily. People live in cities so that they can interact with people easily. People don't love cities because of buildings. They love cities because of people. And that desire has not gone away. The desire to be social animals has not disappeared because of because of the pandemic. I'd argue, if anything, that's greater now than previously. And areas which are focusing on culture and lifestyle and, and community will become more and more attractive places to live and attractive places to invest. Thank you, Dan. Um, Angie, are you seeing the same thing in terms of your sort of sales and rent numbers? We are. I would agree with Dan. I mean, my my view would be build it and they will come. Um, I would also suggest that the local authority housing waiting list would would suggest something different in terms of people that are looking for a home in, in the borough. Um, and we all know that in order to deliver the vast amount of affordable homes, some private cross subsidy is required. I think, again, it's very important create that place, create community so that you're offering more than a home um, and that will attract people in. But I absolutely agree with Dan. We are social animals. The lockdown was was probably horrific for most of us, although part of it I quite enjoyed. But you kind of we all want to migrate and, and get back into a more normal yeah. living. Yeah. Yeah. So from from our point of view, um, yeah, I don't think people are disappearing from London. But what I think people are doing is they're they're looking for something different in the house they live or the or the flat or wherever they live. Right. So, um, you know, our experience with a number of the young people that work in our business is that they really struggle because there was an inadequate workspace. So whether that's, you know, built to rent where you might have communal workspace or whether you you change the way you have storage options in your in your apartments. I think that's what that's what people are looking for. They're looking for a complementary, uh, you know, living spaces. But I think also the thing about culture and being able to get to it within 15 minutes mm. is why everyone loves living in cities. I've spent a long time living in cities and then moved out as kind of family, you know, things change. Um, that's what you're looking for. And I think that's where actually local authorities who are being bold to regenerate you know, their existing stock, their assets, uh, being smart about um, mixing the uses as well. So whether you bring leisure um, and health together. I think that's something that I that we we should all really welcome. Again, make it easier for people to live their lives. So no, I don't think people are leaving in their droves. They're just looking for something slightly different, and we have to respond to that. We can't absolutely. build the same boxes we did twenty years ago. Yeah, absolutely, I agree. Um, a question to the Waltham Forest team: um, Just be interested in your reflections in what you've seen as a result of the pandemic and how. Um, you know, has the borough changed in different places? What are you seeing in terms of the industries that are thriving? Um, where do you see the, the sectors that you would think are, are really going to fly over the next couple of years? Has there been any changes to your sort of resident or um, demographic profile? Be just interested in your reflections, because I think every borough has has been affected in different ways. But it'd be interesting from your perception what, where you see the, the changes and I guess the opportunities that have come out of COVID. So I'll start with this. I think in terms of understanding what COVID has done to our borough, it's simply far, far too soon. You know, you don't understand the results of a pandemic until two, three, four years after that. And what we what we need to be really wary of is making snap decisions based on where we feel we are, rather than actually dealing with a much more important longer term impact. I mean, what is clear, though, is that the pandemic has exacerbated in all sorts of ways long standing structural issues. It may be the the hollowing out of the high street, the business, it may be changes to the way we want to work, as also changes to the way that we do actually work. And what we're seeking to do is respond to those more broadly. Um, I mean, the one thing that is clear is what has come out of it is much greater focus that residents have on their healthcare needs, on their perception of the space around them, mm. particularly, and this is partly, you know, this notion of the Zoom boom. We have town centres which have been much more actively used now in the day by residents. Waltham Forest is no longer a place at which people return to at night, probably just to spend the evening at home and will sleep. They are now out and about in the town centres. That's leading to real revitalisation of some of our businesses, not all. Uh, what we do know is that those businesses that are surviving and are thriving 
are those who are very, very firmly focused on the future, embracing technological change, but also serving their community. Uh, I, I set out before what some of the key sectors that that applies to. Um, and what we're seeking to do as a council is make sure that where we can, we are strengthening those businesses and we're providing them with a really firm basis for growth. And partly that is about being a really attractive place in which to invest, in which to live, in which to uh, enable people both to grow, but also to enable those businesses to grow. Okay, thank you. Um, I just want to pick up some of the, the questions in the the chat and obviously culture has come across as, as you know as a really strong theme for Waltham Forest so the question from um, Annie Pang is um, she's an urban land economist high street task force expert with special interest in the performance sector um, and he's acutely aware that the older generation who enjoy such participation has difficulty traveling to venues and there are genuinely few affordable spaces for rehearsals and performance so um, your thoughts on the provision, I guess, of affordable, um, creative performance spaces? So, uh, an investment in, in a new theatre, which with Soho Theatre is going to be a really interesting test case alongside our Creative Enterprise Zone designation at Black Horse Lane, which we held a big um, creative cultural jobs festival just 10 days ago. It was hugely popular in the Truman's Brewery of Black Horse Lane, which uh, they bring, Truman's kindly provided that venue for us, uh, where we saw 400 young, diverse people. Uh, we're working closely with our adult social services team and families teams. And the new Soho Theatre Walthamstow, uh, EMD, which we're in the building out now, um, we'll provide not only uh, a national comedy theatre, but it, it will also provide a community cultural asset. So a big part of the programme, uh, as well as those big performances and big ticket uh, stars to come and show uh, and invite people across London uh, to Walthamstow in the evenings, will be uh, maximising the community access for cultural, artistic groups, uh, schools, dancing schools, uh, we're trying to create cultural careers uh, to get in, involved in, in the theatre. Uh, and we're using that as a whole. The council's um, property assets uh, to allow people to use cultural workspace uh, and performance space and, and use that in a, in a very interesting and diverse way. This as well. So we are we have a very large community cultural program, and I think well the test case will be about a year's time when we open that new theatre, and this and the soft the soft cultural launch will be aimed at the community rather than the big ticket items. Excellent. And okay. just just to come in on that additionally, this fundamentally goes back to what we mean by the fifteen minute neighbourhood and how we conceive of our place and our spaces, and it's this type of thing how you ensure that there is doesn't have to be rehearsal space. Rehearsal space can just be a room or space within community space. But this is hard baked into our development programme, ensuring that within each of our areas, within every 15 minute area, we do have these appropriate facilities to enable people to live rich and fulfilled lives. Okay, thank you. Um, right, we've got six minutes left. Um, and I'm quite keen to kind of just ask a question to all of you um, to finish off which is um, what do you think has been Waltham Forest's greatest achievement to date? Uh, and what would you like most to see the borough achieving next? And the time scale is entirely up for you. And I'm just going to run through my screen. Um, Jonathan, over to you first. Thanks, Nicola. I think our greatest achievement has been the commitment to embrace growth and work with high quality investors and partners, uh, because the art of the possible is always being pushed forward mm. with uh, some of the innovative um, initiatives we've heard today um, and the commitment and conviction we're seeing from our, our investors. You know, they're putting their money where their mouths are um, in terms of investing in our borough. And I think that's a real good testament of what, what the borough's embraced um, and I think that's our, our biggest achievement because it's led to so many outcomes that we wouldn't have seen five years ago. Thank you. And Dan, over to you. 
Um, I'm going to go for the wetlands. I think the wetlands is the most incredible resource. Mm. I, I think it's still a bit secret. I think we could probably do some, I like to keep shouting about it because I didn't know it existed until about five years ago. And in fact, it didn't really exist in a in an accessible way until about two years ago. And it is so important for the location, for London, environmentally, socially, from an educational point of view, um, to have that space and have that open to the public now, I think is is a real jewel in the crown. And I think that's yeah, hugely, hugely important. And the other thing, my one other thing, if I'm, I'm allowed to, I'll go yeah, for one go other. For it. Which was in the, the video Jonathan put up that over the last five years, more affordable homes have been built in Waltham Forest than anywhere mm. else in London, I think it said. That is an incredible achievement. That is really difficult. That is really difficult for, for both to attract the capital to come in and do that and to make those viable schemes to get them built. And that gets harder and harder with build costs going up and all the demand on land. And that is getting ahead of the game. I know it's still, it's a constant game of catch up with affordable housing, but that's getting ahead of the game by getting it done early. So I think that's, that's an incredible achievement as well. Okay. Uh, yeah, I agree. There's some very impressive stats in there. Um, Councillor Miller, I'm going to give you the last word. So I'm going to come to, I'll do Richard and then Stuart and then Angie. So Richard, biggest achievements and what you'd like to see coming forward? Um, I think the biggest achievement for me actually is that, uh, it's kind of repeating a bit, Jonathan really, is that positive leadership. It's just there. It's just been there for a really long time and it just makes it easier to do stuff because you can go to lots of places where there isn't good positive leadership. So maybe it's a bit ephemeral. It's maybe not in the same place as Dan. Um, I think if there's one thing, one of my reflections would be is there's something around transport. I think whilst it's really well linked, it's how can we get people off some of those big roads that go through Wolfen Forest from north to south effectively? Because you've got a fantastic asset in the forest at the top, and then you want to come down to that really dense urban location at the bottom of the forest. So how can we, how can we create um, sustainable transport corridor there we are that's what I'd like huge challenge okay yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um let's go for Stuart and then Angie and then Simon uh I could give a dozen things but I think the one thing I'm going to say uh, is that we held the first virtual planning committee on the 31st of March 2020 when the world fell off a cliff and we approved a thousand homes half of them affordable one of our biggest regeneration schemes in the borough. And we didn't stop there. We had 12 virtual planning committees and granted permission for over 2,000 homes, nearly half affordable, and a lot of economic development. And we kept going when it really mattered. And that was an issue of confidence, mm. political, corporate, organisational partnership leadership, and being determined to help our residents through this pandemic. Great. Thank you, Stuart. Angie? Uh, chiming very much with what Richard and Jonathan have said, I think the courage to continue with your ambition when we've been faced with something that is unknown to all of us and the achievements that you've made despite the hurdles that the pandemic has brought, I think, again, going back to what Richard said, that really strong leadership and to take it forward um, and the way that you engage with your partners. I think we do, we're able to create and achieve much more when we work together. And that's a real big demonstration of, of, of how the council work with their partners. In terms of improvements moving forward, um, I think we want to have safe our pedestrian links, a bit like Richard was saying, not so much on the transport, but safer pedestrian links for walking at night, um, well-lit areas, making sure that they we have this passive surveillance and making our streets a little bit safer. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Angie. And then um, lastly, over to you, uh, Councillor Miller. Uh, thank you so much, Nicola. I think there are, there are literally so many things that I could list, um, including the absolutely magnificent Fellowship Square, which is just behind me, um, which generations to come will look back and say they made the right decisions in doing this. It will be something that we enjoyed for such a long time. But ultimately, I think it is something less tangible. It is the absolute determination on the part of us as a council, but also on the part of our communities and the people of Waltham Forest to do better and to be 
better. And that is hard baked into everything we do. And it oozes from our people as well. And is a constant source of inspiration and a drive for us to, to continue to deliver and to improve opportunity. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, right, we're a minute over, so I'm going to hand over to Callum now, but I would like to thank the panel. I think that's been a really interesting and very inspirational um, sessions, particularly on a Friday and a lovely way to end the week. So thank you very much um, on behalf of myself, but over to you, Callum. Thank you, Nicola, and thanks to our panel uh, for joining us this morning. Uh, and thanks as well to Waltham Forest Council for bringing this session forward uh, and uh, and showcasing all of the, the great work that's going on. Um, while it is the last day of Real Estate Life UK, we do have one more session uh, left today, a 15-minute wellbeing break in partnership with our wellbeing partner, Therma Group, at 12.30 p.m. You can book on to this session by visiting the programme page on our website. Uh, that link again is www.realestatelife.co.uk. And just before we wrap up this session, we have a short presentation from our wellbeing partner, Therma Group, to encourage you to take a short break, ensuring you remain focused for the rest of the day. Supporting people's wellbeing is at the heart of everything Therma Group do, and they believe it goes beyond individual pursuits and is linked to each other and the natural world. Thank you all once again for joining us this morning and we look forward to seeing you again soon.